I many times think of the way we are on the internet. I, somebody uh, compared it in our group to the Wild West and how we are still still deciding what we're going to do with this. Not even a child, it's an infant, it's an embryo. We, we, it is so recent that we don't really know how to deal with it. And that's been very common in technology, film, radio, the television, is technology marches forward at this really fast drumbeat then morals, policy, laws, social interaction catch up to readjust to deal with. Or even social norms, not even legislated laws. But yes. So, for example, when, when newspapers were brand new, I'm not a uh, historian of newspapers, but, you know, there's this thing called yellow journalism where it was just sort of a free-for-all, kind of the Wild West. Um, and it seems like newspapers took a couple decades to mature, and so maybe that's the same kind of thing with the internet, social media, online discussions, that kind of thing. You know, what's funny decades. is that you mentioned yellow journalism, which is a term that came out of uh, a game from the likes of um, William Randolph Hearst, who was kind of, you know, the Citizen Kane is based on, mm -hmm. but also Joseph Pulitzer, mm -hmm. and who, you know, we, we give the Pulitzer Prize <laughs> for fine quality writing, <laughs> but Pulitzer and, and Hearst were arch enemies. And there was no, there's not very much civility in that, in yeah. their relationship. Mm -hmm. And think of a duel. Barry Lyndon is my favorite Kubrick film. The first scene in it's it is a fantastic it, film. It, I love it too. Yeah. Is a duel. Talk about barbaric. You know, there, it doesn't get much barbaric than that, but it does get at least vitriolic and barbaric in words on the internet. Maybe someday we'll have the Facebook prize of internet commentary. <laughs> <laughs> and people will think, wow, you know, the call he won the Zuckerberg. Facebook. Yeah, he won the Zuckerberg. <laughs> high, high journalism. Yeah. <laughs> that would be interesting. Uh, you know, a couple comments on what was just being said here. Uh, first, I think it's really interesting to note the transition or development of newspaper and news journalism over the course of um, American history. Because mm -hmm. when we first see uh, newspapers develop in, um, in the United States, particularly, let's just start from America as a country, because there were some, some early rags in colonial days, but we'll just start with America as a country. Uh, most of the main newspapers were affiliated with the political parties of the day, the Democrat, Republicans, mm -hmm. the when they were hyphenated, <laughs> and uh, the um, and the Federalist parties mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. And so I think what's interesting is that the assumption of bias, or even worse, the assumption of partisanship was just there. It was understood. If this was the newspaper, you know, X newspaper, that was their affiliation. That was their angle. That was their lens through which they were looking at political instances. Then you move uh, through the 1800s and you get to the late 1800s where we see the, you know, the likes of uh, Pulitzer and Hearst. Um, makes me want to break into a Newsies song. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Pulitzer and Hearst. Thank I think when we uh, get there and we see things like the sensationalism of yellow journalism, that signals a major shift where uh, now journalism is a market-driven model where it is about selling its uh, selling papers to maximum number of people. It's about market share. Uh, it is about uh, journalism as capitalism, not necessarily journalism as partisan politics uh, as it was. So there seems to be that inflection point uh, there. And so I think as we move into the 20th century, you see this development of um, of reform journalism, this idea of like, hey, journalism can serve a social good. Uh, it's part of the early progressive movement in the late 1800s, early 20th century. And so I think from each of those categories, when we land on the internet, we see uh, uh, news media outlets that kind of cater to each of those three components. Uh, and I think that's a very fascinating thing when you start to see those three broad themes of American journalism get kind of like smashed together onto one website. Like, uh, for example, a, a preeminent paper like the New York Times might have a somewhat sensationalized uh, headline to go with a story, but there's still a report on something that requires reform. Uh, they're often accused of being biased and slanted uh, mm -hmm. towards the political left. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see all those three strands rather, uh, affecting one newspaper, one news organization. And I think that's what's often made it difficult for people to interpret information and news online is you see what used to be either you know three distinct eras or three broad strands that usually had their own groupings of 
uh, publications now pushed onto one platform, it becomes very difficult to sort through those and understand, okay, what am I looking at objectively? What's being subjected to more subjective lenses? Really good insights. The old print, old newspapers, I would love to hear you talking about newspapers, Tim, because I'm a huge newspaper nut. I have a huge collection in my office. Nice. Love he actually it. subscribes to the paper newspaper. It comes on his porch every morning. That's awesome. Sits so with his can copy. Can you imagine? You, you ask as if that's a freak of nature. <laughs> yes. uh, Whenever there's breaks. an article that, that annoys him, he spits his coffee out onto the paper. <laughs> when you had to sit down with a typewriter, put paper in, set the margins, and type something, there was labor involved, then there was thought. It's like the old days of editing that we were talking about yesterday, too. The mm -hmm. old film editing days of feeling it through your fingers. It took l labor to do it. Whereas the, on, on the online situations, it actually uh, rewards the opposite, which is mm -hmm. the quicker you respond, and mm -hmm. with more volume you respond, the higher y your comment goes. Yeah. So it's exactly the opposite of sitting it, down. Exactly. Doing couple thoughts I, I had on that. One um, is this idea of how quick it is uh, and how fast it becomes. I do wonder if that starts to shape the language that we use. That's something that's mm -hmm. of real interest to me as I've seen the shift in language because I don't really think anonymity plays as big a role as we might mm -hmm. think. I mean, I think initially on the internet, mm -hmm. anonymity was a thing, but then platforms like Facebook have become game changers where they invite that transparency of making our, you know, private lives public uh, in so many ways, like the name like Facebook, like you mm -hmm. are known by your face kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because what I've seen in the last few years uh, is uh, recognizing uh, platforms like Reddit or YouTube where anonymity is somewhat encouraged or uh, it's just a part of the platform and Facebook is more public, my name actually goes with my face kind of thing, uh, is especially in the last few years, that doesn't really seem to affect the vitriol. It has mm -hmm. continued to get vitriol, You're absolutely even right. when people can yeah. uh, know who they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, it, and I think it's not so much connecting the name, but I, I really do think it's an issue. It can be an issue of distance. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and so, in this case, we're sitting across one another. We're in physical presence yeah. uh, with one another. I think if we were even speaking on a phone or on a Skype chat, where we have, where we see an embodied person, <laughs> a physical mm -hmm. presence with a voice, uh, that almost instantly can put that civility filter in place. Hopefully, for most people, it still seems to have that effect. But when you have this mediated space of a digital platform where it is not real time, it's asynchronous, uh, so you're, it's not a direct mm -hmm. give and take, you can seriously do a, you know, uh, a rhetorical drive-by. Drive -by, yeah. yeah. uh, you can... Uh, fire and forget and not even consider the consequences of it, um, I think that has a big part to do with it. Uh, and I th it really is of interest to me how that could affect people's language use. And we talked mm -hmm. yesterday as well about uh, the limited scope of what can be expressed on online platform. I think of the you know ever expanding like button options on Facebook, mm -hmm. but at the same time those are still limited for how we can react to something. It says you can only react these in these ways. Kind you of can thing. type a comment though. Yeah, certainly. Uh, you certainly can. Um, and I think, and many people obviously do, but often it can be just a reflection yeah. of what they clicked on the like button. In fact, what I appreciate is when I post, share an article or something on Facebook and I have friends who like the post but then disagree with me in the comments. I'm like, okay, I think that signifies <laughs> some degree of civility. Like they're like, they appreciate it I shared. They still disagree with me. Thanks. That signals we can have a discussion. People have a voice now and mm -hmm. it's, it's powerful and wonderful and frustrating at yes. times. Yeah, so I think that that is one of the chief advantages of this new technology is that people have a voice and to give another example, Tim and I work in digital learning and we put together online classes. And I like to tell a story for um, two uh, new teachers that are teaching online for the first time. I say, imagine that you're sitting in a classroom with 30 people and you have this great discussion. You know, you're, you're saying stuff, students are responding, people are bringing up new ideas. And after an hour, you walk out of the classroom thinking, that was one of the best discussion times we've ever had. But if you watched a videotape of it, you might realize there is, of the 30 people sitting in there, only 15 people ever said anything, and mainly only seven if you're people. Lucky. Yeah, if you're if you're good at it, and maybe only seven people carried 80 percent of the conversation. But there's these two people in the back that never said a word. Uh, these three people over here were disengaged, 
And the advantage of doing an online discussion for an online class is that people can't hide. They, everybody has to participate as part of the grade. And here's the other thing. Some people are sort of wired to process things verbally and to think through things. And so, so they're really good. You know, they think on their feet, and they're the type of people who flourish in an um, in-person discussion, whereas other people need more time to sort of sit and think. And they may shine in an online forum where they can look at the question, think deeply about it for a long time, then write something really profound. Um, so I think it does, it does sort of open up opportunities for different types of communication, different types of students. Uh, you know, some people think verbally, um, as the joke goes, some, some people you can tell that they're thinking because their mouth is open, <laughs> and other people you can tell that they're not thinking because their mouth is open, <laughs> and there are some people for balance? whom both is true. You know, a couple of thoughts I had um, as you were talking about um, this idea of uh, digital platform, communication technology being such a powerful uh, tool in democracy, and I, I agree. It has, that's one of the things I think that we're still trying to figure out with the internet and digital communication is just what does this do for a democratic society? Mm -hmm. And I, so far, at this point, can it change? Absolutely. I think there are some really good signs that it's changing in beneficial ways. Um, but as you said, it's frustrating. It's a frustrating process. But one of the best points or best things I've heard said about this particular cultural moment of digital communication uh, technology completely making um, media power so disaggregated and so disseminated out in a democratic society it came from uh, journalist Joe Klein. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him at all. Um, he, was giving a, uh, he was giving an interview on a podcast uh, where he was actually, he, he, this was an offhand comment, but it's been sticking with me for over a year because I, it was so insightful. It, he was making a comment about a book he had written about how uh, veterans come back and come out of the military and then are re-engaging in society and how they're doing it. And he was just wrote a book about this. But a comment he made on American society in general as he was talking about this book was that we are trying to do democracy without citizens. Mm. And that is mm. a deep concern to me in a culture where you have this power of voice spread so broadly, uh, or spewed would even be a good <laughs> word for it, I guess, in many cases. And, I, and that's really put me on a, a search to understand, like, what does this mean? Not for democracy. I feel like that's a question that's mm -hmm. have a pretty good conversation going. But when we look at digital uh, communication, especially on social media platforms, uh, the question I've been really asking myself lately is, what does this do for citizenship? Mm -hmm. What are mm -hmm. we learning about what it means to be a citizen? Um, from what we read, from how we interact with it, from how we interact with others. Um, and so far, especially in the last two years, I've, been, I've had more cause for concern than cause for hope. There's moments, there's moments where I see things that are hopeful and good signs, but it gives me more cause uh, for concern. It makes me think, how do we teach citizenship in this kind of environment? What kind of citizen is required for this kind of environment? Uh, because there's some talk about this thing called digital citizenship, which is a fairly new phrase that hasn't be really been well defined uh, in the social citizenship respects. It's mostly defined in terms of access to the internet, which isn't very helpful for these moments mm -hmm. of disagreement and interaction. Um, but I think one of the things that we need to be aware of and that we need to consider when it comes to this is we don't want this technology as a good for democracy to become an end in itself. This idea that, oh, I can project my voice, I can be heard in a democratic society, uh, that is a mere method of democracy, and we don't want that, m that method to just become an end in itself. Uh, we want it to become a way in which our role as citizens is amplified, but we want to amplify the role of good citizenship and the stewardship of the public. Because we're trying to do democracy with consumers or democracy that's with, a great with way of viewers. Putting it. Yes, What's absolutely. What's a democracy yeah, of true. viewers look like? <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really good way. I think that's a really good corollary of that quote. And if I can just bring it the integration point in, and I'll finish on this thought, is that I think, you know, we think of ourselves as Christians, as citizens as well. Mm. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And so um, how do we interact as citizens of that kingdom, even mm. as we're being citizens of an American society? Very good. I think that is where the tension lies, especially in online spaces for 
uh, Christians. I mean, that's something Zach and I were talking about yesterday is this idea of um, how do we be good ambassadors in these spaces, recognizing that we have a higher citizenship and a higher call, but also recognizing that out of that we can model better citizenship mm -hmm. in these spaces. I mean, I just think that's an area of con for very fruitful conversation.